Is blogging dead? That's a question that I saw recently on threads. And I was like, why are people asking this question? Of course, it's not dead. But hey, some of us may be scratching our heads going, is blogging still a viable way to grow our business, get more leads and more traffic? And that's why I'm excited today to talk to KP and Jesse all about blogging and how to use it as a tool to grow your business. But first, a word from our sponsor. I've recorded over 300 podcast episodes. Yeah, it's a lot of podcast episodes. And I've tried a lot of different virtual recording studios. But my favorite has been Riverside. Riverside makes their virtual recording studio look so profesh. My guests love it. Plus, I also low-key love recording YouTube videos in here as well because it's so easy to use. My team also loves Riverside because it spits out separate audio video tracks, making editing Easy breezy, lemon squeezy. And if you want a little magic, they've got this tool called Magic Clips, which uses AI to take your video and turn it into perfect social media sized videos. I'm talking vertical videos for TikTok and Instagram, Facebook Reels, all the places you can post these videos with the captions included. And you don't have to hunt and search for that perfect clip. So if you want to try this out for yourself, Click the link that goes with this video, or if you're listening to the audio on the podcast, it's in the show notes. Okay. Click that link. Use the 15% off coupon code. It's Drea, D R E A, and try Riverside for yourself. Thank you, Riverside. Hi, and welcome to episode number 323 of the Mindful Marketing Podcast. I'm excited to have KP and Jesse on the show. KP, Jesse, welcome. Hi. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah. I'm excited to chat because. I know blogging's not dead, but it is a question that keeps coming up time and time again. And I want to get pros, experts like you on here to to dash those uh, sneaky little thoughts. But first, I'm curious about... Well, first, let's start a little bit with your background. Um, How did you two start your business? What is the origin story? So I started Inkpot back in 2020. And also, this is KP speaking, just so that you guys can recognize my voice. But... Especially we both graduated in 2020. We all know how the world was back then. And honestly, on a whim, we moved out West. I had trouble getting a job and ended up just kind of stumbling into starting my own business after interning for an online course consultant, which was a lot of fun. And she kind of like showed me like, KP, you should totally just start your own business. Like you have enough skills, you can do this. So I started out actually as a social media agency and then kind of shifted into brand and web design and then eventually brought blogging into it. I got really, really busy about two years in and Jesse actually had a full-time job at the time. And I was like, I need somebody to help me out. Like I can't keep doing this on my own. Either you can come help me or I'm going to have to find help somewhere else. And that's sort of where Jesse ended up joining me and started doing a lot of website development. Okay. So Jesse, I'm curious as someone coming into this, what's been your, uh, what's your experience been like? It has been one that's definitely interesting and not at all where I thought my life was going to be like coming out of college. This is not what I thought I was going to be doing, but it's been something that's been like super fulfilling and super fun. And every day is like a new day. There's new things to do. There's new problems to solve. And you know, it's always, it's always a new adventure. And I've been able to learn so many things. Like I never really thought I'd be doing website development. I never liked writing throughout my entire like career in school growing up. So I was like, I'm never going to be a, blog writer like are you kidding me why would I sit down and write all of these things and now I'm like okay blog post 45 minutes out done like start to finish I'm super confident in it I know all the ins and outs of it like I've been able to kind of pick it up so it's been really fun being able to constantly pick up new skills and learn new things and kind of adjust as things change and grow in the market and in the industries and with Google and all of these these other things that just keep getting thrown out there. So it's definitely something that I absolutely love doing and I couldn't imagine doing anything else now. If you told me I would be a podcaster, for instance, like, you know, 10 years, 15 years ago, I'd be like, but what would I talk? about. And now, you know, 320 episodes later, I'm like, I could do another 320. Like I could do this all day. So I I think sometimes it's like finding um, the space where you feel most confident and comfortable, and then it's easy to show up um, that way. 
All right. So let's talk about blogging. You said you recently brought this into the business, into the agency. Uh, why blogging specifically? Like what uh, sparked interest in this content marketing strategy? So I started my first ever blog back in 2012. I had a book review blog. Publishers would send me books to review when I was like 14. It was around the time of like the Hunger Games craze, if anyone remembers that. <laughs> and I used to get really into like just reviewing books and putting my thoughts out there. Blogging was very different back then. You could pretty much treat it like a diary. Now it is very different. The whole landscape of blogging has changed a lot. But essentially, we studied abroad in 2019. I ended up turning that blog into a travel blog. And then I always have kind of been like running that as an extra business on the side because it does kind of bring in some income, but nowhere near like what the design work does. So I was like, I wonder if there's a way to combine both of these. So then a few years ago, I want to say it was the beginning of 2023, we ended up adding blogging into our services. And it was basically just kind of like a test thing at first. I reached out to some of our clients who we had done design work for. And I was like, hey, we have been blogging really well over at our travel blog, we've been getting around like 70,000 monthly page views. And I was like, I want to just test and see if this is something that we can make work for online businesses. And before long, it turned into like our most popular offering. And we were really starting to see results for our clients. And it's just been one of those really fun things where like we can test things out on our travel blog first, just to kind of like see how things work and then bring those new ideas over to our clients. Oh, I love this idea that it came from a passion project too. Um, and I find that I, for business owners specifically, a lot of our best ideas come from like, oh, I'm genuinely interested in this thing. Um, what you, you mentioned, there was like a turning point um, for the success of the blog um, for your brand, for Inkpot. Um, do you have a defining moment where you were like, oh, this is really working for us? Um, tell me that, like some of the the details of that story. I think the biggest thing for us was switching to what we always like to call the keyword first method. So we had put out so much stuff on the travel blog, like a ridiculous amount of content that just wasn't really doing anything. And eventually we were like, okay, let's take a look at keywords and actually look into this. And basically in the SEO world, the second we started doing keywords, obviously it takes a while for everything to grow with SEO on Google. So it's not actually the snap of a finger, but once we started using keywords, we started to see that growth and we were seeing people coming mm -hmm. in. We were starting to rank better on Google. We were starting to see ourselves, you know, very easily ranking on the first page or even getting up to the number one spot on Google with our travel blogs. And I think, and even with uh, like Inkpot kind of bringing that into the, the Inkpot blogs, I think that was really the big turning point of like, okay, we're not going to sit here and essentially what feels like waste our time writing all of these mm -hmm. posts and putting out all of this content without actually knowing if someone is searching for this. And if we even have a shot at ranking for it on Google, because some of the things we were going for too, I think where we were at the moment, we just had no chance of ranking for it because everyone else ranking was just had so much more authority and, you know, all of the kind of factors that go into ranking, they were just so much higher. And we were like, we shouldn't have done that yet. We could have like waited and built up a little bit and then done it and had a really good chance of ranking. So I think taking that kind of keyword first approach and doing the research, taking time to understand what makes a good keyword, what to look for when you're trying to figure out if you can rank, if you can't rank. And then bringing that into the blog post is really the turning point of, okay, we're just putting content out and now we're putting content out that is actually getting us something in return. Yes. I love this keyword first approach. Um, I think it's, it is very different though, from what blogging was back in the day, like back in my day. So I started blogging in 2004 and it very much was like, basically the evolution of live journal, right? Like we, we were still posting our little thoughts and, um, it was very much like a diary experience. Um, and I distinctly remember starting to follow specific bloggers because I would search for specific topics and then be like, Oh, I want more of this topic. And then I'd become a super fan of specific bloggers. One that comes to mind is the Skinny Confidential. Um, this was like a huge blog back in the day. I think she's still doing it now. Um, a huge blog back in the day that I distinctly remember being like, oh, I'm refreshing her website to see when new blogs come out. 
And I feel like that has changed a lot. And I think this is where the conversation of like blogging is dead has come from. And I keep seeing people say it on threads. And maybe it's just my algorithm. Mr. Al is like treating me nasty. But have you been hearing these rumors, these rumors, blogging is dead? And what are your thoughts when people say this? Oh my gosh, I see those threads all the time too. I don't know where they're coming from. I don't know who started this rumor, but it is so not true. And our favorite like sort of example of that is last time you were wondering what to make for dinner, you were looking for a certain recipe. Odds are you went to Google and ended up on somebody's blog to learn how to make that thing for dinner. So 100% not dead at all. I That's how I make like 90% of my stuff. My husband always teases me because I'm like, I'm going to make this for dinner. And he's like, haven't you made it before? I'm like, yeah, I just, I need the recipe though to like guide me. Otherwise I'm clueless on what's to happen next. But I think it's a frustrating conversation because as marketers, I can see through it. I know that the person saying blogging is dead is then going to be like, and here's what you should do by my thing, right? I can't be alone in this, right? Do y'all see this too? No, absolutely. I feel like we see it all the time. And a lot of the times it can end up being like, buy this instead, but it's a very short term marketing thing that might get you quick results in the second, but it's not going to do as much for you long term. And you're going to be constantly involved with it and having to like, show up every day or put a lot of like, here and like constantly working and working and working and working and like burning yourself out doing it. Whereas blogging, you can take that same effort that you put in at the beginning, write the blog post, make sure it's optimized, make sure you're actually targeting keywords. And that's going to continue to grow and kind of help you and sustain over the course of the next few years. I think also the waiting period is what gets a lot of people of like, you're not going to post a blog post and instantly have it rank. Obviously, once you get to a really high point, that can totally happen and you can post something and it can start to rank instantly. I know even on our travel blogs, we started to see, you know, we'd post something new and within a week or so, it would be, you know, the second page of Google, the first page of Google. So obviously, you know, the more authority you have on Google, the likely, more likely you are to rank faster. But I think sometimes they're like, well, it doesn't work because a week later, two weeks later, you're still not seeing any results. You're not seeing any traffic. But then if you look back, at that, you know, six months later, you're like, wow, I'm seeing constant traffic from Google. Now I'm getting inquiries coming in from this blog post. You know, I'm seeing people talk to me about this and mention it and, you know, say things about it. So I think sometimes the long-term part of it, I feel like is what people kind of get stuck on and not being able to take a step back and be like, okay, this is going to take a while. I'm going to have faith in it. I'm going to have confidence in it. I know what I'm doing. And once I'm, you know, consistent with it and I'm giving it its chance, it's going to start working out for me. Okay. Yes. I want to dive deeper into this concept of like, what makes a good blog? How do we get traffic? And then how do we convert that traffic? Because I think it, it is very different from the, the good old days of like word vomiting your thoughts. Um, and especially as a business owner, it definitely has to be strategic, right? We don't like, we don't want to put all of our time and energy into something for our business and not have it actually bring us business, right? There's a difference between like a just for fun project and like we're trying to make money here. So let's start at the beginning. What's the process like for creating content that not only brings in traffic, but also converts readers into leads? So definitely keyword first. Always like do not waste your time writing anything without looking up keywords because our kind of philosophy behind it is... That's what people are searching on Google. That's what Google is telling you people are searching. So why are you going to ignore Google? Who's the one that's going to basically decide if you're going to rank or not. But you can also think that something is a keyword and it's either completely wrong. No one's searching that at all. Or literally flipping the way you say it can make the difference between, Mm -hmm. you know, no one seeing it and everyone seeing it. So one of our favorite examples is if you look up the searches between like HoneyBook versus Dubsado and Dubsado versus HoneyBook. It is the same exact topic. There is nothing different about that topic. You are comparing the two of them, but they have significantly different search terms and or search volume. So why would you not? I mean, obviously our advice would be put both of them in the post, makes you have it both ways. But if you stick to HoneyBook versus Dubsado for the entire post, you never say Dubsado versus HoneyBook, you might not hit the people looking for that keyword. So always do research first. And then we also like to suggest having basically content series. So similar to what you would maybe do on, you know, TikTok or 
Instagram where you're kind of talking about the same topic over and over and over again, you want to do the same thing on your blog because what that will do is it will give people a route to continue looking on your blog. It'll give them additional posts to look at that are related to the topic. It's going to give them different avenues to stay on your site, but it's also going to position you as the expert and Google loves it when they're like, okay, you know what you're talking about here. You have, you know, 15 posts on this same exact topic. So obviously you're an expert in this area and we feel confident, you know, putting your stuff up in the rankings because you know what you're talking about and people are staying on the content. They're enjoying it. They're, you know, taking it in. So I think we always like to kind of think about what are, you know, the main pieces of your business or the main things that you want to promote. Like we have a lot of series on like blogging and like basically everything you could want to know about blogging. We have a lot on brand design and all of the ins and outs of brand design. Same thing with website design. So kind of breaking things down into smaller questions. I know we get a lot of times like, well, I'm going to run out of topics if I like do that. You will never run out of blog topics. Like it is almost impossible to run out of topics to blog about. And so just taking that and kind of breaking it down, thinking about questions that you get asked every single day by your clients or your customers, odds are they're not the only people asking those questions and other people on Google are going to be asking that, you know, finding ways to highlight different projects that you've been doing or anything like that. That's, that's a great place to start. And it's going to build up these series and these pillars that are going to make you feel like an expert to Google and to your readers. And it's going to give them more content to take in because we want that. Like, Oh, I want to like see what's next and like click more and like see more. And that's going to keep them on their site. It's going to keep them engaged with you. And it's going to keep you kind of top of mind when they're thinking about whatever it is that you're, you're writing about. They're going to be like, Oh, I got all this great information over here. Like, let me go back over here and look at this and maybe, you know, book their services or buy their product or whatever it might be. Oh, this is so good. Like I'm over here already thinking about a series that I could do because I just launched this threads workshop and I was like, I should probably like start blogging about threads. Maybe Um, you've inspired me today. I'm curious. You mentioned uh, this like a follow up question. You mentioned um, doing keyword research. Is there a particular tool that you recommend for that? We love key search. That's what we use. I think it's like 15 or $17 a month, something like that. Um, That's our favorite one. The other one that uh, you can use that we would suggest is Uber Suggest. That one, they have a free version. You only get five searches a day. So you got to kind of think it's three or five. So you got to kind of like do a little thinking and make sure you're not wasting all your all your searches if you're, if you're staying on it for free. But Key Search is definitely our favorite. You get a ton of information on there that you can use to kind of figure out what you want to do to rank and if there's anything you need to add in. You also see everyone else who's ranking. So you can make sure that like what you're putting out is content wise, the same answering the same question. You're not putting something out there and be like, Oh, that's not actually what people are searching for when they search that question. Like I just did something completely different. So that's definitely our, our go-to. Yeah. Okay, cool. Love those. We'll put those links in the show notes. Um, okay. So next question is all about balance. And I used to work for a, um, I was an intern at a marketing agency. This was in 20, 2012, I want to say. Um, so like we w- we did local um, SEO. Keyword stuff every page. That was a strategy in 2012, right? It was like, I lived in Atlanta, right? So it was like listing every single city, town, suburb of Atlanta. Um, and the, the pro- project I was working on specifically for was like a water damage company. So it was like every single keyword that someone could possibly think of for water damage in Atlanta. <laughs> and that was like my entry point into marketing. And that strategy is so it's like so old. Uh, but I think there's a um, there's a temptation sometimes to like go, oh, I'm going to put literally as many keywords as possible. So how do we balance between like optimizing for search, but then also writing something valuable that people want to read. So our best advice, especially when it comes to working on your posts in particular and like making sure they're actually optimized is honestly treat it like you would like your high school English essays. So literally make an entire outline, do your keyword research while you're making that outline and just like pop the different keywords in the spots where you think you'll use them before you even write. So then as you're writing, you can make sure you're not keyword stuffing and try not to say the keyword more than the times that you put it in there. 
honestly, you always want to make sure you're writing people first. I think there's been a huge shift over the last few years of Google really preferring that, you know, human first written content, especially with the rise of AI and everything like that. Like it, it can tell when you're yeah. keyword stuffing, it can tell when you're being too robotic. So that's definitely something that you want to pay attention to. And if you're using the keyword more than once every 500 ish words, I would say you are probably starting to near the side of keyword mm -hmm. stuffing. And it's totally okay to use like different variations. So like Jesse was saying, you know, Honeybook versus Dubsado and then Dubsado versus Honeybook. Like that's totally okay. But you don't want to be saying, you know, Honeybook versus Dubsado in every other sentence because then people are going to be like, what the heck is this person doing? <laughs> Right. I've definitely read articles like that where I'm like, I don't even understand this one because it's just a bunch of the same words over and over again. So yeah, I love this human first approach. I feel like honestly, all of marketing is this way, right? It's the human on the other side of the screen is the one going to be making the decision. So we kind of got to keep that in mind and also be strategic about it, which I love. Um, so besides SEO, what are some of the ways that you promote the blog to increase traffic to the blog? So we are major fans of repurposing everything. So taking your blog, if you have an email list, getting it out to your email list, it can literally be as simple as, you know, every time you have one, you have an email template that you use that you either give like the main points of the blog or just like, hey, a new blog post is up, put it out there. Um, on social media, anything like Instagram, if it's an educational type post, almost doing like an Instagram carousel with just the main points of the post is great. It gets people kind of that like first little taste of it. And then it's as easy as just being like, if you want to learn more about this or see everything, like click the link in my bio to go read this week's post or whatever uh, it might be. Um, threads. I know threads is coming up, literally copying and pasting like parts of the blog posts on threads. I know we've started to do that a little bit and it starts conversations. It gets people talking it gets people to your site to kind of learn more and read more. Um, we also have started using Pinterest more. So putting things on Pinterest, using, uh, we have created some like basically templates in Canva that we can kind of swap out to promote each blog post. And so having it out there with, you know, the keyword, some information about it in Pinterest and putting it out there can start to drive more traffic to your site and kind of hit we kind of want to think about everyone's going to be using these platforms differently. Not everyone is going to be using every single one. So the people on your email list are going to be different than the people who follow you on Instagram versus threads versus TikTok versus people finding you on Pinterest. So kind of spreading it out and like putting it out there in different forms on every platform that you have can just kind of expand that reach so that you're not just completely missing an entire subset of your audience or of people who might be searching for it who aren't in your audience yet. If you do use like TikTok or even YouTube shorts or anything like that, literally taking pieces of the blog post and just like face to camera, saying it out loud, talking about it. And then, you know, being like, if you want to learn more, like go here. Um, so that's kind of a, a great way to do it. And also these, all of these social media things can start to get you traffic to the post a little quicker while you wait for, you know, the SEO to kind of take effect and Google to kind of pick it up and it to start rank. So it's a great way to get eyes on it. The more eyes you get on it and the more Google sees people like constantly going to it too, it's going to just boost your authority and Google might be like, okay, this is obviously something people want and like, and it's something that can be trusted. So, you know, we're more confident ranking it higher knowing that it's going to be good information. So all of those kind of can work together, but like it takes no effort at all to take pieces of it and just copy and paste it or say it in front of a camera or, you know, reword it slightly and put it out on all of these different places. And I know sometimes we've had people be like, well, yeah, but what if people are seeing it like seven different places, they're going to get bored of my content if they're constantly seeing the same thing. And my philosophy with that is if they're seeing it on your blog and Instagram and TikTok and your email list, like they're obviously a fan of yours and they're not going to be mad that you're seeing, they're seeing your face pop up or they're seeing your content. So it's not going to affect you. Yeah. The super fans. I love that too, because I'm, I love repurposing. Okay. Like if we work hard on this blog post, we're going to share it out as much as possible because we want everyone to see it. And sometimes people see it once and they go, oh yeah, I need to read that. And then, you know, life happens and they're suddenly on a different app or scrolling somewhere else or like chasing after their dog. 
And then they need to see it again to be reminded, oh yeah, I meant to read this blog post. Let me go read it. And so I love repurposing and the big brands do it too. So we can do it as well. Um, but you mentioned this kind of like momentum that builds up, right? We share it on social, we get the initial traffic and then Google picks it up. So let's say all of that's happening and we're seeing the page views go up. Um, how do we keep that going um, once the post is published? So I think one of the biggest things is that it's not going to be just that singular post. So like, it's the same thing as, you know, one of your TikTok videos being picked up, that can be great, but it's not going to mean that your whole following is going to change overnight. You're going to, you know, all of your videos are going to be super successful and like, you don't have to put any effort into anything and they're all just going to like skyrocket immediately. So part of it is going to be constantly putting out more content, new content that is valuable content. The more Google sees it, the more they're going to trust you, see you as an authority the more even like your regular website pages can start to rank. So it's not just people getting to your blog. It's people also getting to the other pages on your website, which is great. But when it comes to that specific post too, one of the other things that we've seen is going back to it and making sure that it stays updated. So especially if we're looking at anything that is time relevant, anything that has to do with technology, anything that has to do with like, buying practices that might be changing over time, all of those things, you know, we can look at threads wasn't around, what, like last year, but now it is. Yeah. And that's a huge thing. So we want to look at what we're actually putting out, making sure that the content is still relevant to whoever's going to be landing on it today, because the last thing that we want to do and what can actually start to hurt you is if you put something out, you never touch it. Someone gets to the post a year, year and a half later, and they're like, this is all completely useless. Like this doesn't even exist yeah. anymore. There's something that's totally different. There's an entirely different way to do this now. So making sure that we're going back to the content, we're updating it, we're adding anything new that comes in, we're adding any new personal experiences or takes or anything like that. Google loves when you're like, I'm the expert at this, here's why. Here's, you know, what I've seen work. Here's what I've seen hasn't worked. Here's why I love doing this in a way that's still focused on informing the reader because we never want to make our blog posts all about us or all about our clients. Yeah. We want them to be informational, but making sure that um, they, they stay updated and you're still consistently putting out content throughout the duration of, you know, hopefully the rest of your business. We would never suggest stop like just completely stop blogging. Um, so yeah, just keep keep putting content out and Google will continue to, to see you as someone who is putting out trusted information. My first thought when you're talking about this is like, yes, I understand that this is important and it sounds like a lot of work. Like, I don't know if it's just like the season of life that I'm in, but as soon as you said that, I was like, oh man, I can already think of like three or four blog posts that I need to go and update now. And it sounds like a lot of work. Plus, I have this new thread series that we've just uh, determined I need to write. So with all of that in mind, how I'm kind of skipping around a little bit in my questions, but how do we stay consistent with blogging and with especially updating the blogs, as you mentioned? So for updating the blogs, we actually recommend creating like your own sort of like spreadsheet on the back end so that you'll always know like when you publish posts, when they're like due to be updated. So we actually do this in Notion. We like love Notion, we use it for everything. But we just basically, every time we hit publish, it's just like kind of in our post publish process to go in there, add it in. We like categorize it and everything just so that we can have really cool views and kind of like sort things if needed, like on the back end. And in there, we'll just kind of like put like a preliminary date for when we think that we should go and check it just so that we are kind of like keeping it top of mind. Do we always check the posts to make sure they're updated? No, we're really busy with a lot of things. It's totally okay if it's like, you know, a little bit longer than you planned on going and looking at it, but just to make sure you are looking at them, you know, every once in a while, just to make sure that they are working well. And if you really want to kind of decide if it's worth even looking at, if it's a post that's bringing a lot of traffic, then it's probably a little bit more worth looking at just to keep it updated than one that maybe is like getting one page view or less like every month or something like that. So definitely trying to have like some sort of back end system will help a lot with that. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned traffic. That was going to be my next question about like, how do we tell if a blog post is working? Like, what are some of the metrics that you're looking at? How are you looking at these? Are you using Google Analytics? Like, I want to know all the details. So yes, if you do not have a Google Analytics and Google Search Console set up, stop what you're doing right now and go set them up. It literally takes like five minutes. 
They're free, super easy, but it gives you so much information and details that can help you figure out what's working, what's not working, what's ranking, what's pulling in traffic, everything like that. So Google Analytics will give you an insane amount of information that can feel very overwhelming at times because you're like, I don't even know what all of this stuff means. Like this is very overwhelming. One of the biggest things that we look at there is just your views. We kind of look at it over the past 30 days. So for our uh, monthly blogging clients, we'll track their analytics and kind of look at it over the past 30 days and see how it's growing as they start to get, you know, four or five, six months into this, when we start to kind of see those SEO metrics take off. So making sure that you're actually getting views and kind of seeing that grow month over month. Google Search Console is really great because it will give you your traffic specifically from Google Search. So analytics will show you traffic from everywhere. It'll show you how many, you know, you can look at how many page views a certain page or post on your site got, but that will be from every single source. So any links that you've sent out there, Pinterest, social media, Google, all of that. Google Search Console is going to be specifically the Google Search page. So that gives you really valuable insight into, okay, how many people are actually clicking on my post from Google? Is this post working? Is this something that's catching people's eyes? That's another thing. We want to make sure that like our titles, our meta descriptions aren't super boring or plain because if you think about your own habits on Google, if you see a really boring title and a really great title right next to each other, you're going to click on that really great title. So seeing what posts are, are kind of getting clicked on, which ones are performing really well. This is where kind of looking at those content series can come in. If you're like, wow, all of my posts about threads are doing really well. Maybe I should, you know, lean into that a little bit and start doing more of these posts on threads so that I can, you know, keep this traffic rolling in, answer more questions that people are having, all of that. And similarly, if things aren't performing as well, you can kind of look at it and be like, okay, can I take a different approach to the next blog post that I write on this? Is there something different that I can say or a different way I can say it to maybe see if that changes the, you know, course of who's actually clicking on it, who's who's coming to the post and see if that affects the traffic in any way. So both of those, like 100%, do not skip out on, on adding those in. And if you are a service page for, for provider who is, you know, having people inquire with you on a contact form or anything like that, having a question that just says, where did you find me? And including like Google, SEO, blog, one of those, all of those with like slashes in between, whatever, that's a great way to track that as well, because sometimes we don't even realize that the people coming in are actually finding us from Google and we're just completely missing out on being like, oh, wow, this is actually working because we're not asking the question. So asking that like very simple question can also give you kind of a little like confidence and the little push you need to be like, okay, we can, we can definitely keep doing this. This is definitely working. Our clients always get super excited and will message us and be like, I just had another person come in and say that they found me off this blog post. Like, this is so exciting. So it's definitely something that, that makes blogging feel more worth it because you see that like actual conversion of they landed on my blog post, they inquired with me. Um, so definitely something we don't suggest skipping out on with that as well. Yes. Those little, when people fill out the form and they're like, how did you find me? I'm always pleasantly surprised. Like I know I shouldn't be, but I'm like, it's working. You know, like I love seeing people like I found you on Instagram or I Googled you or, you know, my friend told me about whatever it is. I'm always like, yes. <laughs> Um, so I love that option too, to like prompt people to say, how did you find me so that you could know that it's working? I love that. Um, so speaking of what's working and what's not, has there ever been a time where something you tried with blogging, a strategy that you tried didn't work as expected and tell me about it. So one thing I will say, we tried this internally on our travel blog. We have never tried it on Inkpot's blog or any of our clients' blogs, but when AI first came out, it like kind of exploded in the travel blogging side of things, like almost a year before it started to kind of really pick up in the business world. And so we tried writing, just like having AI write a post and just putting it out there to see what happened. 
and it did not work. It was it was not great. Like copying and pasting a post from ChatGPT, or I think at that point we were using Jasper. Um, any yeah. of these AI tools, just copying and pasting, it's never going to work. Google is getting better about picking out what's AI and what's not, and people are getting better at picking out what's AI and what's not. And that's really the kind of big point of that is we want to make sure that people aren't like, this was written by AI or a robot. And are there even any real thoughts in here? So I will say like, we even tried to optimize it with SEO when we like, we were like add in keyword. No, it, it didn't work. It's never something we've tried on Inkpot or our clients blogs because we we're like, this did not work on, on this travel blog. And like, that's kind of our little guinea pig tester. So I would say avoid just having AI write an entire blog post for you. It is something that if you are struggling coming up with ideas or figuring out, you know, sometimes it'll help if you're just like, I'm really stuck, like writing this introduction, having it help you kind of come up with ideas or formulate, you know, what you can say or anything like that. That can be, you know, helpful, especially as you're first starting out when you're like, I haven't written anything in years and now I need to sit down and write like, a thousand word blog post like this feels super overwhelming. But definitely you want to make sure that everything is your own words, your own content, your own thoughts. You have to remember that if you just are like, write me a blog post, it is going to pull information from across the internet, which means it's going to pull stuff from other people's content. You're not getting your real thoughts in there. It might be you know, some things that you would say anyway, but you want to make sure that it's all your thoughts, your ideas, making sure that you're putting your own personal experience in there. That's what's going to rank. That's what people are going to connect with. And that's what's going to keep them kind of sticking on your blog, sticking on your website, everything like that. But try and avoid using it to write the whole post. Repurposing, it can be like amazing. It can help you repurpose Mm. content so quickly because you can just be like, here is the blog post that I wrote. Take this information and like shorten it into an Instagram carousel, you know, uh, caption or anything like that. Then it's taking your own words, your own content and just shortening it. That's kind of a completely different thing. But starting from scratch, it did not work out. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned AI because I do feel like And I talk about this all the time. It's the perception of AI that gets people excited. There's the perceived value in that, you know, I can just say, um, AI, ChatGPT, write a blog post on like how to use threads for business. And it's just going to like regurgitate what's already out there. And I already know the way that I do it is different than, you know, what's probably out there. And so I wouldn't do it that way, but I do love using it to be like, um, here are my thoughts on this blog post. What are some ways I can use this keyword in a title? Um, and I almost never use what it gives me, but I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a good idea. Let me run with this one and like take it farther. So I love using it as more of like a, like a thought partner versus, uh, write me an entire blog post because I'm so scared for the day when like, we Google something and it's just all like regurgitated AI BS. Like I really hope we never go there. Like I love the personal stories. I love the insights, the anecdotes, the analogies that like AI just doesn't have that. Um, so yeah, I'm glad you mentioned it. Cause I'm so passionate about like, please don't copy and paste from chat GPT. We can tell. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So, um, final question. How do you see blogging evolving over the next few years, especially considering this conversation of AI? And I'll also add in, I've been seeing people say lately that um, ChatGPT has been recommending them as like, you know, for services, which feels like it could be competitive to SEO or is there a way to optimize AI? Maybe that's another conversation, but... How do you see blogging evolving over the next few years? I think the biggest thing with the rise of AI, we are going to see, funnily enough, a shift back into human focus, human first content. And I think it's been really cool. People have had a lot of fun, like looking at it, playing around with it, you know, seeing the results pull up on Google, anything like that. But I think people are realizing that they really like the human to human connection, the stories and unique angles that people take 
like you said, if everyone's just saying the same exact thing, that's not really helpful to anyone. Like we're not getting any thoughts out there. We're not getting any new ideas. So I think it's, it's going to shift back to, no, I want people to say something new. I want, I want those hot takes. I want someone to connect with me. I don't want something to sound super robotic. Like I want to hear someone's personality in their writing. I don't want something to sound super corporate. I want to get to know you and your content and your ideas and what you do through your blog post. And I think those are the ones we're going to see people gravitating towards. And eventually I feel like Google is going to have to be like, okay, these are the ones we're going to rank because these are the ones that people are clicking on. This is the content that, you know, the general public wants. And I know for a while, we kind of saw this a little bit for a while. I don't know if anyone noticed, but like Reddit started showing up at the top of rankings in Google. And this was like a huge thing that Google did has done like big updates over the past year. And Reddit started popping up to the top. Even if you didn't specifically search like Reddit, you'd ask a question and all of these different Reddit threads would come up. And part of it is that it's that actual like human people saying their opinions and being like, this is my experience. This is I what I think. Here's my opinion on it. So I think we're going to continue to see that people are more and more leaning into like, no, I want to hear unique opinions. I don't want to hear something that I can go into chat GPT myself and say, hey, how do I write a blog post? It's going to give me information. I want to know your secrets, your tips, your hot takes. And that's the information that I'm going to consume. Yes. I love that. I mean, honestly, that's why I love Reddit too. It's like, I don't want like a generic piece of advice. I want to like hear a story about someone else's experience. Um, and also it feels less like, less like someone's trying to sell you something when it's, when it's a personal experience. Right. I think this just goes for anything. Would you, you know, buy something directly from a billboard or would you just ask your friend like, Hey, what hairstylist do you use? You know? And so I feel like there's something to that, like, um, casualness, um, and personal experience that really can can make the difference. So I'm excited about the future of blogging. I love the diary blogs, by the way. I love being nosy. Um, give give it give it all to me. I love it. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. Okay, so you have a freebie for those people who are listening who are like, yes, I'm here for blogging. Where do I start? You have uh, free blog post ideas. Tell us about it. So this is 123 blog post ideas for creatives to kind of get you started, get the juices flowing. I know that's normally the part that you know, we've seen our own clients are like, this is great, but I just don't know where to start. I don't know what to write on. I don't know what people want to see. So this is kind of your way to be like, okay, look at all of these topics that you can write about. Like people are looking for this stuff. Take this, put your own spins on it, kind of apply it to your own industries and, and take the content, however, you know, whatever direction you want to go in it. But it's really a way to get the ball rolling and get you writing because when it comes down to it, the sooner you start writing and publishing posts, the sooner it can get picked up by Google, the sooner it can start ranking. So we're always big advocates of just like, get started, get writing. It's going to feel awkward at first, but it'll get more and more comfortable. You'll get faster and faster at writing content. And at the end of the day, this is stuff that you're probably talking about on a daily basis. This is services that you provide on a daily basis, things that you're doing on a daily basis. So you're just writing about things that you're an expert on, it's going to take you no time at all. You already know the answers to all the questions. You're just writing it down on a page. So this will get you going, get you started, give you ideas so you can kind of run with it and finally start blogging consistently. Yes. Okay. Y'all grab this link. I'm putting it in the show notes right now, onlinedrea.com slash three, two, three, Jesse KP. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thanks so much for having us. Yes. And thank you, dear listener. Before you go, I do have to tell you, I am speaking at the high end wedding summit, which is hosted by da -da -da, Jesse and KP of Inkpot Creative. If you are a wedding photographer, this event is for you specifically if you want to break into the luxury market. So join us for the high end wedding summit to learn all about how to hone in your branding, market your services and master your back end systems to attract more high end wedding clients. And I am doing a special session 
all about how to use the power of video to do so. Even if you're not a videographer, actually, especially if you're not a videographer, this session is for you. And the best part about this event is that it's completely free. I'll put that link in the show notes as well. And as always, if you're listening to this podcast, make sure you give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Helps keep us in the top 100 marketing podcasts. And that's all because of your support. I'll be back at you soon with another episode. Next week, we're talking all about podcast pitching. So stay tuned for that. I'll see you then. Bye.